Thank you very much, and thank you for those wonderful poems. It brings back all that memory of those countries. Thank you, all of you, for coming. Now, it's a good thing that it's not a huge crowd, because then I'm going to be slightly unorthodox and let you interrupt me if something comes in your mind, and I'm happy to answer you on the spot. Because although he was generous enough to say that I can speak for as long as I want, I certainly don't want to actually take you up on your word and have everybody leave. So um, um, please, please feel free to just raise your hand if you, something occurs to you. Um, is there a way that I can move the slides? I want you to understand what is happening. Uh, so I'm doing this lecture now in reverse, basically. That uh, here, this is Abu Kamal. So the ISIS, now the IS, the Islamic State of Iraq, actually has these two, uh, I mean, basically they're showing IS and okay. This, this is Aleppo here. Yeah. I don't think that this really should be fully red like this. Because what happens is they have pockets of the problem of Aleppo, but really what they have is this which is their door and this which is Raqqa. Now just for uh, um, giving you a little history, Harun al-Rashid was the great caliph of uh, Bazaar, probably I've heard his name. 18 years of his life, he actually lived in Raqqa. This is a complete mud brick city. And it's really worth a visit. I don't know how much has been left after all this, but this is Raqqa, and uh, there is those. And then here you have the province of Mosul, Diyala, Anbar. If you, uh, I mean, so this is Diyala, Anbar, this is Anbar, and Raqqa is here. So this part, this is what ISI basically controls the pockets here and pockets here. Mm. So uh, effectively what they have been able to do because of uh, their rapid military progress in this region is uh, that they have basically obliterated this border between Syria and Iraq, which was of course drawn at the during the time of France. And they have carved out, you can say, a kind of a region here, which is, these are all majority Sunni areas. Now to go back one step, uh, maybe some of you know this, but just to refresh your minds, in Iraq, the majority population, more than 60% was Shia. Whereas Saddam Hussein's Kotri, which was from Tikrit, was a Sunni Kotri. So for 40 years, they were ruling pretty rough shot over the Shias in Iraq. In Syria, it's exactly the opposite. The seven, almost 70% of the population of Syria are Sunnis. Whereas the Alawites, who are a fairly eclectic sect of the Shia, are uh, now doing the same thing to the Sunnis in uh, Syria for the last 40 years. So why, so this really tells you an important reason why it has happened that despite the Syrian government having an army, there being an Iraqi army, how is it that they were able to take and carve out this thing? Reason was, on, if you take the Syri uh, Iraqi side first, um, after the American invasion of uh, of Iraq in April 2003, essentially what happened was there was occupation till America actually withdrew in 2011. But through that they arranged uh, two elections. The first one was of course under occupation. The second one was also under occupation. The last one was after the Americans had left. All through Naturally, because of the majority that the Shias had, um, Mr. Nouri al-Malki has been Prime Minister and remains so, even today. Now, Mr. Malki decided that, you know, 40 years we Shias have been oppressed, so now it is payback time. So essentially, forgetting principles of democracy and all that that one should think about, of minority rights and so on, 
he marginalized the Sunnis of uh, Iraq and he ensured that they didn't get any role in the governance. So they were chaffing at the bit that, you know, all of a sudden it's strange to have no power. So that was really the kernel for the, um, for the growth of this Sunni Islamic movement to which was added two other things. One was uh, during the American occupation, soon after uh, the American occupation of uh, Iraq, uh, the then American viceroy in uh, Baghdad um, called Bremer uh, decided to what he called de -bathify. You know, the, the Ba'ath party runs across the entire firmament of society and polity in both these countries. So by de all of a sudden, the, all the government servants, all the army, all of them Sunni, were... Uh, uh, let them... Uh, like me, I think, yeah. No, you can. yeah, I can see it, but okay. So all the um, polity, which was in this kind of a situation, they, um, they sort of... They left, uh, they felt that this needed to be corrected. And that's how uh, Sunni resistance started. Now, initially, that group called itself the Islamic State in Iraq. Because, you see, that's the other problem. That, uh, oh, what am I doing? So you can just click it over the next yeah. one. This. Uh, okay, but let me go back to the old map before yes. I get to this. Can I go to the map that you had? Oh, that's gone. Okay, leave it now. <laughs> Take it. Shut up. <laughs> okay, let, let me just do with this map. This is what Iraq looked like before ISI. You saw the other map where it's clear that this is the part that has been uh, taken over by the ISI. So, it started off as the Islamic State in Iraq. Now, what was happening at the same time in the last three years in, on the Syrian side of the border? What was happening was that despite tremendous amount of foreign infusion of equipment, funds, commandos, other kinds of troops, the majority Sunnis who were actually opposing, all Syrian opposition groups are all Sunni groups. So these groups were not able to dislodge the Assad regime. So then the IS, uh, ISI, the Islamic State in Iraq, decided to cross the border and said, okay, let's establish a base in Raqqa and Deir Ezzur. So then it became ISIL, uh, the Islamic Gru uh, State in Iraq and the Levant or Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, which is the same thing. And uh, now, of course, with Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi having declared himself the caliph or uh, having declared himself in favor of establishing all over the world what is called the nizam -e mustafa that is Muhammad's law, which is Sharia. He has uh, claimed for himself the right to decide all these things. But that having happened, now their <coughs> ambition has gone further. But let me now go back to where I should have started. I wanted actually to tell you, this is of course the same thing, this is the, the minaret on the, in the Umayyad Mosque. Um, this is the third minaret of the Umayyad Mosque, which uh, is the only minaret of, only, of the, any mosque in the world which has the six-pointed star of David on it. Now, I, how did this happen? This is the six-pointed star of David. Uh, is this the point? This side? No. Yeah. So, uh, you see, this is the six-pointed star of David. Now, it's not by... Uh, how did it happen? And that's what I want to take you to the next slide. That exactly what is being lost. While all this is happening, let's not forget the big picture of what are you losing in what is going on today in Syria and Iraq. What you're losing is basically the birthplace 
and the syncretism of the three religions that we know probably as Western religions, uh, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. This is the entire upper and lower Mesopotamian basin, Syria and Iraq, in the basin of the two rivers, Euphrates and Tigris, that uh, these three religions and these three civilizations were nurtured. And a great example is the Umayyad Mosque, which started off as a Greek temple uh, to Zeus, then a Roman temple uh, to Jupiter, then to Zeus. Then it became a, a Jewish temple. Because population and their persuasions kept changing over these centuries. And uh, so it became a Jewish uh, temple and that is where that Star of David and they put uh, the minaret on top of that. It's called the Jesus minaret because that is the day they, in Islam it says that on the day of judgment that is where the prophet will appear on that particular mosque. But in this mosque, the Umayyad mosque, there is also said to be the head of John the Baptist, who is uh, revered as one of the prophets in Christianity, but also in Islam, who is known as Yahya. Similarly, the head of, um, of the main battle that took place on the battlefield of Karbala, which led to the Shiism in Islam between Shias and Sunnis, so Imam Hussein's head was brought to be shown to the Umayyad Caliph in Damascus. That's the first big Muslim dynasty. Was brought to be shown to him saying, okay, isko mar de. So for one day that head rested in the Umayyad Mosque. That is why today it is a place of great pilgrimage for all the Shias of the world, not just from India, but from Iran and all over the place. So again, that is there. Then if you walk around the mosque of, uh, around the Umayyad mosque, you can still see different parts of the time when it was a church. You can see the old lintel of the church. You can see the inscriptions in uh, Latin. All that is still there. So over more than 2,000 years, this particular place has been hallowed ground by some religion or the other. Why does this happen? It's really an inquiry that one needs to go into. But how did it happen that they did not erase anything? They just built on it according to whatever they needed. Sometimes I wonder that whether such a solution could have been possible at Babri Masjid, but anyway, let me not get into that. Um, now, the second important thing that what is being lost that has come from the entire is of course, as my wife discovered the Car Carnelian Trail. Now, Carnelian is a stone which uh, is normally occurs only in India and Brazil. But uh, in Ugarit, which is, let me... Uh, yeah, well, uh, I can... You know, this, around here, this is the Lepake, and this, this somewhere is the uh, civilization which grew on, at Ugarit where they have excavated up to, I think, the 6th, 7th millennium before Christ, where they found gold jewelry with carnelian stone. Where could the carnelian stone have come from? It could only have come from India, because Brazil was not part of the known world then. 7th millennium before Christ. So, th this is the kind of... Uh, uh, this is some of the things I've just noted. Now, Syria is at the confluence of three major civilizations. The Arab, that is the entire Arab, the Persian, and the Turkish. And in fact, when I was transferred from Syria to Turkey as ambassador, I probably must be the only ambassador who actually drove up to his new post. I drove across because it's 1,100 kilometers from Damascus to Ankara. But when we crossed the border, I thought that the villages on the other side in Turkey would also speak Arabic, but they didn't. I've never known such a clear division at that crossroads of the three civilizations, but it's there. But it was all part of the, Umayya, uh, of the Ottoman Empire. <coughs> then, of course, as I have written, as a place of pilgrimage to Muslims, whether it's Najaf and Karbala, there are 21 Shia places of pilgrimage there in Syria. Um, it is also the home to a large number of Islamic and Christian sects. 
unfortunately due to partition in india we tend to look at hindus and muslims thanks to this uh, terrible two nation theory as at least at islam at least as a monolith that's not the case islam is as divisive within itself as hinduism is and remains so on the syria jordan lebanon border they have identified 70 different sects of islam i mean they talk of the shias being ethnashir that is those who believe basically the dif- distinction is do you believe that muhammad is the only prophet or are there other prophets the shias believe up to 12 but there are far more than 12 uh, i mean who are not in the list but who most of them are actually in existence so um, this is the kind of diversity that you find all these therefore are very diversified and composite societies whether it is iraq or there is turkey however much you deny it all these things come up when these things happen um, the other thing what actually characterizes syria and iraq is that these were the only countries now i'll count iraq out of it because it's become a very islamic oriented state even without the is Uh, these were the only two countries which followed what was called the arab baath socialist uh, arab baath socialism it was based on three things first was unity that is unity of the arabs then liberty that is freedom from colonialism and all that and socialism but what its guiding principles were the most important and that is why india always had good relations with them the first is that they believe that there should be a complete divorce between the authority of state and the religious authority and uh, the second was women's empowerment these were the only two countries where you would see women driving cars women working in offices all that kind of thing which you can't see anywhere in the country so there was a certain evolution in their thinking which was good for us and of course they were committed to arab unity and that's why we were close with them on the whole non aligned set up also so uh, now what therefore they represented was the secular stream in arab political thought as against the islamic stream which was is represented by muslim brotherhood their clones and then their even more extremist uh, things al qaeda and the other even more salafist groups now today what you are seeing actually is a resurgence of the islamic trend within arab political thought within arab governance which was had been suppressed for the last almost 50 to 60 years because of the resurgence and because of the strength of um, the secular strength now this happened of course because uh, I, one can say that the, on the one hand the, the non aligned movement gave it a lot of credence because that's what the non aligned movement was all about about tolerance about um, but the other thing was that all these potentates who held powers for decades provided stability for western interests in these regions and that's why that was willy nilly that had to happen so this is what is being lost and that is i hope i've been able to convey syria's geo strategic location and how it makes a difference and how therefore what happens in syria will condition more or less what's going to happen in the rest of that region because if you actually get into a more islamic governance the degree may differ but then the whole idea of any kind of a secular ethos goes by the wayside and in a way from india's point of view we are going to have to rethink how are we going to deal with these countries because I mean, to digress for a minute, we know that the Islamic Conference Organization, or as it's called, the Islamic uh, Cooperation Organization, is a new name, has been passing uh, resolution after resolution for the last 60 years against India. One on Kashmir, thanks to our good friends the Pakistanis, and secondly on the state of the Muslim community in India, which makes me believe that even if tomorrow you are able to solve Kashmir, that second item is never going to change because now of course we always are told by members of the islamic conference organization that you know our relations are very good bilaterally don't worry about it because there we have to okay we don't worry about it 
But when we are economically strong, we don't even have to worry about it because they'll come running to us. And that's going to happen sooner or later because, as you know, by 2015, the United States is going to become self-sufficient in oil. They're, in any case, let us say that their demand for uh, oil from the Middle East is going to keep going down. Where are they going to sell this oil? There's only India and China in terms of quantity. So things are going to change, but this is how these things are moving at the moment. And that's why I mentioned oil and gas. I'll come to that later. Um, so just to uh, focus your mind a little bit, where we are, uh, this is the Gulf, where uh, you have all these uh, Gulf kingdoms, Syria, yeah, and this territory. Now, this, this is just, and this is what it looks like close at hand. So what is happening thanks to the, um, the ISIS resurgence is that it has further exacerbated the civil war that is taking place in Syria. And of course it has led to a war between the ISIS and the Iraqi regime. Now, as I was uh, slightly moved away, but let me come back to the point, why did this happen? Number one, Mr. Malki decided that this was payback time and he doesn't need to bother about the minorities. Which, of course, made common cause with the failed protest and militant protest movements against the Syrian government. Because they are also Sunni groups. So that's how they got together. That's one reason. Now, a reason for this, of course, is three long years, two Geneva conferences, two UN special representatives, and no, no resolution of this civil war that is going on in Syria. The reason is very simple. Because, uh, as you know, Russia and China are firmly backing Syria. So one would ask, why is it that they are so firmly backing? Because Syria is not Libya. You know, it was very easy when the, after the Arab Spring and all the Arab protest movements started from Tunisia all the way down into, it was very easy in 2011 for the UN Security Council to unanimously agree to actually take military action to dislodge Gaddafi. Mubarak went on his own. When Obama said he should go, he went. Ben Ali went without anybody asking him and uh, so on. But in the case of Libya, uh, Gaddafi said uh, he's, not, he's not going to leave. Although he had more or less completely finished off any state institution in that country. Then, of course, the problem there was that in the Security Council, when the resolution was put up by the Western country, the Western powers, they, uh, they said they wanted to do this for, uh, remove, for regime change. The, uh, the Chinese and the Russians basically said that, you know, how do you know that you'll change the regime? And secondly, what about what will happen? Because if you're only going to do aerial bombardment, how will you ensure? Nevertheless, that resolution was passed, and it's strange. The resolution says that the aerial bombardment in Libya and Tripoli and others will be done in order, it doesn't say to uh, dislodge Gaddafi, but to protect civilians and civilian occupied areas against Gaddafi. Now this raises very, very fundamental issues. Can the United Nations Security Council, tomorrow there is a, some kind of an insurgency in India somewhere in the north, can the UN Security Council take a decision they are going to bomb these people out of existence? Because, uh, and go over the head of a legally constituted government, because whether you like it or not, nobody had dislodged uh, Gaddafi, he was still the president. Anyway, he got killed. In the Russians felt very strongly, and so did the Chinese, that they had been taken for a ride on the whole Libyan thing. That's why in Syria, they have other interests, but this was an important interest, and they said, we're not going to. Let them decide what they want to do. That is when the second thing kicks in, which is foreign assistance to all these groups in money, weapons, heavy equipment, and why, which are the people who are doing it. First, of course, certain Western countries, especially France and UK to some extent, but also Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey. When I was in Syria in uh, April 12, which is about two years ago now, but I was talking to the advisor of President Assad, 
and she told me that you know the Turks came to us and said we can arrange a talk between you and the Muslim brother uh, in Istanbul so that so Asad said that this is not what you have come here for if you are a friend you stop this conversation but this, apparently she told me before they left they, they told uh, Erdogan's representative that you are telling us this today but this is going to come back to you and it has started coming back. You will notice in the last six months, the Turks were very active on this whole pushing because the Turks are a moderate Islamic country, uh, Islamic government now, but Erdogan has taken it upon himself to actually push uh, that envelope as far as it goes. But uh, about four or five months ago, they realized, you see, uh, now the, the ruling clique in Syria are the Alawites. Alawites lived in the, live here, you know, in this, uh, this region, this is mountainous region, you know, there are two ranges here, one is called the Lebanon range, which you have to cross to go to Beirut from Damascus, that's about around here, and the other is called the anti-Lebanon range, anti meaning facing, and that's the one along this uh, coast, and that is where the Alawites, actually, that is their home. The Alawites, uh, of course, have imbibed certain things from the Christians and so on. They are far more tolerant than most of them. And the interesting thing about the Alawites is that they are about they are about 17 percent of the population. But they were like uh, I don't know what word to use. But let's say they were literally at the bottom of the heap in Syria. So what did they do? You see, uh, during French colonial times, th those are the mountains where black tobacco was grown. Those of you who smoke or used to smoke, you must have uh, probably smoked these French cigarettes called Chitan and Golwas, which use black tobacco. So this black tobacco is to come from there. And who are the tobacco farmers? The Alawites working on the uh, tobacco farms of the rich Sunnis. And what did their women do? They were mostly given in almost lifetime uh, uh, subservience or uh, like a job from the time they were little girls to work in the houses of these rich Sunnis. That is why when Assad first took office, after a revolving door of democracy there, he said, okay, it's payback time. So it's always payback time. So what happens is that while democracy is all very good in all these countries, what essentially needs to be absorbed by political leaders anywhere, certainly they don't forget it here, is that if you can win political power through the ballot, you should be also prepared to lose it through the ballot. That second part is nowhere in the ken of these people. But that having been said, coming back to the foreign assistance that was being given to all these countries, all these uh, groups, it came, as I said, from uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, Qatar and Turkey. Now, that represented basically a proxy war that was uh, unleashed after the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. We have lived in Iraq. Nobody ever talked of Shia and Sunni and whatnot in the 80s. You were first an Iraqi, then an Arab, then possibly if you got to religion. But never was religion mentioned. That Pandora's box has been opened and it's going to be difficult to... So now everything, and now of course the Americans analyze it in terms of a Shia crescent and a Sunni crescent and so on. But religion has become, yes please. Just a small question, like uh, during Saddam's time and during Hafiz al-Assad's time, hmm. uh, what was, as you said, like the composition of Iraq was like 60 percent Shia and the population of Shia largely Sunni. How was the composition of, if the ruling class was a small clique of uh, Sunni Absolutely. and but were other parties. In both cases. Yeah. How, how, how was, uh, I mean, in army, in other important, uh, where Shia that in Iraq and where Sunni in Syria were located on that time also they were uh, powerless. Because when you are in Iraq war, mm -hmm. if the 60% population is not fighting or it is not joining army, then how it... Uh, well, the thing was that, uh, let me give you both examples, but let me start with Syria. Now, and that also will explain why is Syria not Libya? Why is it not possible to dislodge Assad? With all these forces of the world uh, backing these groups, can't happen. It can't happen because the population of Syria is 22 million approximately. Out of that, the Ba'ath Party, now the Ba'ath Party has an existence uh, all across 
the society, the polity, the economics of it, meaning every sector the Ba'ath Party is represented. And the membership of the Ba'ath Party today is around 3 million. Now, these are people who are directly owing their allegiance to Assad all across the country. In a country of 22 million people, how are you going to dislodge them? Second is the trade guilds. You know, they still like our trade uh, associations. They are all with Assad. And they account for a membership of about two and a half million. Their army is only about 400 or 450,000. Because in all these countries, which is another thing, but let's, let me not get, keep dry gracing, but uh, the army is about 400 to 450,000. Essentially meant for protection of the nomenclatura and all those in it. So the best of all possible worlds in Syria or Iraq, or let's say in Syria is to be an Alawite, to be a member of the Ba'ath Party, and to be a part of the army. Nothing can touch you. Because in all these countries, the army, including our friends again, Pakistan, the army is a state within a state. It is beyond public accountability. It is beyond laws. So uh, it's really the army which, and you see a very classic example of how this works in Egypt, which is the most crucial country in this region. And what happened? There's all these protests in Tahrir Square. They properly elected Mr. Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood with 75% votes in a fair election, not like the one that's just happened in Afghanistan. And within six months, the same people went there saying, get him out. And then who are they left to go back to? The same old army. And Mr. Sisi becomes now the president. So this is the story of all these countries. And that's why all these protest movements are just because the rearguard action by entrenched forces has been so strong that it has not been possible to overcome and get into some semblance of democracy. Now, democracy in these countries is not to show that people have power. Democracy and elections are held to get the imprimatur of the populace to whoever is ruling. And that's what's happening. Iraq, same story. Again, Ba'ath Party spawns across. That is why the debathification by Mr. Bremer affected everyone all of a sudden, all of a sudden from a babu in some office who may have been a Ba'ath Party member uh, to some other person who was told, you don't go to office, you have no job. And in all these countries, the largest paymaster is the state. Either they are state undertakings, they are governments earned, they are this, that. So what was the field? So you could be a Ba'athi as well as a Shia in, in uh, Iraq. But of course, you would, you, would be, you would notice, you may not get the promotions which you thought you should. And similarly, there, uh, Assad followed a very careful policy of co-opting important Sunni families over the 40 years. For example, um, there's a very important family in uh, Aleppo called the Jabris, who's, uh, I mean, Mrs. Uh, what's his name, the field marshal who has defected to, his son has, anyway, it will come at class. Uh, now, Mrs. Class is a Jabri. So that way, Assad ensured that he will co-opt. So from a small coterie of being either a party member or a member of a particular sect or a member of the army or any one of the three, he expanded it to include important Sunnis who had money, Sunni landlords, to put them into the spoiled system. So now the situation is either you sink together or you swim together. So to some extent, uh, even the Syrians today who may not be Alawite, who may be Sunnis, who may not quite like Assad, are scared because they say the, a known devil is better than the, an unknown devil. What's going to come? And they see what's going to come. They see it on the streets. They've destroyed above all what has happened is that normal life in these countries, in these cities has become impossible to continue, apart from the refugees and so on. Um, so this is what it looked like before, and this is what it looks like now. You see what, what a tremendous difference it has made, Raqqa there as well. Now, parallelly what has happened is that uh, the the top part, I mean, 
what is Iraqi Kurdistan, which is here, this above Mosul. Maybe there's another map I can show you. So as I was mentioning, some reasons for the change, I've already mentioned that there's mounting sectarian violence that started, which has only exacerbated because of foreign infusion, and which has not succeeded in whatever their goal was. Inability of the UN to resolve the conflict, marginalization of the Sunnis in Iraq, and the inability of the Sunnis to overthrow Assad in Syria. Then, uh, yeah, that's the, another, another interesting thing. Now, if we think that all this, sorry, you raised your hand. Should I continue? No, no, that was no. a long time ago. Yeah. Um, So, uh, another very interesting thing that is happening is we think that maybe all these ISI, ISIS or IS groups, all the Sunni groups are together. That's not the case either. Right now, there's a jagda, I mean, a conflict going on between the Al Qaeda and groups backed by them, like uh, the Al Nusra Front and, and this guy, Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, who has declared himself Khalid. So, apart from an intra Muslim conflict, there's an intra Sunni conflict going on. Yes. <laughs> but basically the thing is hmm? basically the thing is that you have the Al Qaeda which set up uh, different branches like Al Qaeda in Yemen and Saudi Arabia, Al Qaeda in Iraq. Al-Qaeda in Mali, Al-Qaeda in Nigeria, the Boko Haram, you know, they've got all these affiliated groups, not to mention our great Taliban are also involved with them, plus half the groups in Waziristan in Pakistan with the Pakistan army claims, claims to fight, we don't know whether what the truth is, but anyway, they are all linked one way or the other to Al-Qaeda, so that is one part of it, that, so what does it mean? It means that their goal is that overthrow whoever is in power here. What Abu Bakr Baghdadi by declaring himself a caliph and with meaning basically that the Nizam and Mustafa, the Islamic system will be put in place in all over the world, has taken his struggle or his jihad, made it transnational. That is the difference which, is, which we see right now. So, um, now, all this is going to have a major effect on all the countries in the region. Firstly, how does it affect Turkey? I mean, first effect is going to be of what has happened, has happened a long time, which is the Kurdish regional government of Iraqi Kurdistan. Now, this was created in 1990, after the first Gulf War, when President Bush, the first, decided that he will have a no-fly zone covering the 38th parallel, that is basically this latitude, uh, so that Saddam Hussein's aircraft could not bomb the Kurds, which, who are in this area. And on the basis of that, the Kurds actually set up an autonomous, I mean slowly moved towards an autonomous Iraqi Kurdistan. And uh, that then has been consolidated even after the elections in Iraq because now here is where oil comes in. Where, is the, where are the rich deposits of oil? One is here, southern Iraq, where uh, they have their most uh, important field that is Rumaila. And we had the field right next to it called block number eight, which was given to us by Saddam. The Americans tried to take it away from us but now uh, it has been offered to us again, except that the Iraqi oil ministry has changed the terms. That was an ENT or exploration and uh, prospection contract. Whereas now they are only giving service contract, which means that you don't get a share of the produce, you get a fee for what you've done. We're trying to see whether that can be changed. We had another field here called the tuba field, which we were supposed to exploit with the, um, with the Algerians. That unfortunately we've lost. Now, the, so this is the big oil rich, then here there is oil, and here in Derezor on the Syrian side there is oil. There we have seen a field um, actually uh, burning for days when we were once in this area. But these are the oil rich. so in fact as you will see, all these areas that the ISISI 
No oil. They have no oil. So uh, now Iraqi's Kurdish Afghan government is telling the central government of Baghdad there's a continuous jagda going on as to who has the right to give contracts to the oil, who has the right to get the revenues. All this is now has been up in the melting pot for the last, since the American invasion. Despite that, a number of oil companies have actually gone and signed contracts with the Iraqi Kurdistan government, including Reliance, which has actually invested in a field in, uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan. But that is what we see. So the first effect will be the next step of what the Iraqi Kurdis are going to do. Because as you know, uh, the Kurdistan, if it was an independent province, would cover like this. Because uh, the Brits and the, they cut Kurdistan into four because they, it would then be the most powerful, most rich but landlocked country in the world. So there are about 15 to 20 million Kurds in Turkey. There are about five to six million Kurds in Iraq. Uh, in, sorry, in Syria, there may be a, around the same, a little bit more in uh, Iraq, and a little bit more than that, around 8 million in uh, Iran. Now, the fact that with, if supposing this thing goes, that the ISI decides, let's say ISI is able to hold on to the area which is under its control, and from all the reports I see that they have actually appointed governors, appointed district administrators, they have actually got a system in place. If that is going to happen, then it may be a de facto state, landlocked, not oil rich, but highly militant. The Iraqi, I mean the Iraqi Kurdistan government has actually, here is Erbil, they, their Peshmarga, Peshmarga, both, uh, there are two Kurdish parties, the KDP and the BUK. Uh, they both have militias called the Peshmarga. Peshmarga in Kurdistan, in Kurdi language, means ready to die. Basically, I also want to tell you that the Kurds are like us. They come from the Indo-Aryan group. They are not Semitic like the Arabs or the Jews. So when you speak, when the Kurdis speak, they also count like us, ek, do, teen, char, panch. And they have great affinity to India, great affinity. The poor fellows, all through their existence, first, as I said, they were cut into four, put in four parts in as part of uh, Iran, part of Iraq, part of Syria, part of Turkey, where everywhere they were oppressed. For example, in Turkey, when Ataturk declared the independent state of Turkey, the Republic of Turkey, so, of course, the, uh, the Kurds said, but, you know, we are not Turks. He said, no, anybody who is in this border is a Turk. So they said, who, who are we? You are mountain Turks. That's what he called them. <laughs> so, so you just negate. So all this thing, so that is the f first effect that's going to happen, which we need to see, because if there is already a kind of an opposition movement, militant opposition movement by Abdullah Ojalan in Turkey, which used to get sucker in the border, you know, this is Turkey, this is the Iraq border. Here, the PKK had its bases and they would go and hit uh, the Turkish army here. So Saddam agreed to have a Turkish brigade posted here, inside Iraq, while he was there, to hit the PKK from the back as a favor to the Turks so that he could get other favors from them because his oil used to go from Mosul to here. So that's what he agreed on doing. So th the PKK was being hit from the back, but the Turkish army here had another uh, important goal, that is to prevent any movement towards Kurdish independence. And their job of the brigade there, and still there by the way, is to ensure that neither of the Peshmargas take over Erbil, because that is the putative capital of Kurdistan. And that is actually where we are at today. So all these liberation movements are going to have a problem uh, with all these countries because basically these countries will be broken up. Turkey has a population of 85 million out of which 20 million are goods. Not to mention, now coming to Turkey, what is the effect? That is one. Second is Alawites. Now everybody keeps cursing the Alawites for all that they have done or may do. But the point is that the Turkey, that Turkey also has about 8 million what they call Alevi which is the same fellow, 
It's just that in Turkish it will be Alevi. <laughs> and one of the reasons why Tur Turkey all of a sudden cooled down on what they were doing here, because they were sending equipment through here to Syria, you know, through in this area, sorry, in this area, this part. Uh, they stopped it because they realized, more or less actually what happened in Sri Lanka during the anti tamil riots, that the houses of Alevis in the provinces neighboring the Syria-Turkey border, that is around here, were being marked for a possible future, you know, burning or whatever it is. And that's when the Turks realized that this is coming home to roost. Exactly like the Saudis realized that initially they supported the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and then they realized that the Wapas Garaiga. That's why now the Saudis and the Qataris are uh, supporting different groups for this reason. So this is the, and the same thing will then permeate to Jordan. It's already spilled over to Lebanon and it will permeate here to Kuwait because you know it's interesting that the Shia majority areas of Saudi Arabia are also the oil rich. <laughs> so, and these are here. So all this from here is going to come here. And Bahrain, of course, is majority Shia, and Kuwait's going to have a problem here. So once all this you st it starts unraveling, thanks to the ISIS, this is going to be a long, drawn-out struggle. And we, our problem, coming to India quickly, first is, of course, we have still 39 people who are kidnapped. We need to find channels to do it. The only channels are, I think the Kurds can help us because the Kurds fight the ISIS. But those you fight, you also have a back channel for exchanging prisoners. We should be able to use that. Second is, we can also, of course, which we are doing apparently, uh, to go through the funders of these groups, like through Qatar and so on. Uh, the sec that's one. The second thing is that now you have instability in Iraq and Syria. The government has to bring, them, bring people who want to go come back. Now, this is the tragedy. When I was in Baghdad, we had the same story. Iraq-Iran war started, 22,000 Indian workers, all of them wanting to go. But when they were actually present, said, OK, you can go, we'll arrange it. No, sir, we don't go now. Why? No, we'll see a little more. Because this is the tragedy. Our people go there because they have sold everything to go there and find work. With what face are they going to come back? So they are prepared to take that bit. This is the story. And this is the tragedy. Today I see the same story happening there. That there are people who want to go, but when you present, present them, ki, okay, we'll take care of it. Then they say, let me wait for a few more days. That's why people have not gone in the large numbers that we thought they were. We moved 10,000 out of 22,000 people between 10th and 20th of October 1980. But it was quite a job to move them by road when the Iranian planes were attacking from Baghdad to Kuwait and then out from there too. But some such thing, but I fear a bigger problem, that if this instability continues, in Saudi Arabia we have close to 4 million people. Can you even think of bringing 4 million people back? You're going to have to actually have boots on the ground to protect them. And we have to do a lot of contingency planning to look forward because I don't see that this all of a sudden is going to just die down because it's all open now. now. And this is, I think, our biggest problem. Second is disruption of oil. Oil international prices going up. The Iraq now presents about 18 percent of our crude requirements. In the early days before Iraq got involved in all these wars, the Iraq-Iran war, Gulf War One, Gulf War Two, Kuwait invasion, you know, ek ke baad ek. But let me just complete this. Iraq and Iran can provide 50%, we used to provide 50% of our oil requirement, they still can because all of them have huge reserves. But uh, when is that going to happen? Meanwhile, we have to find other means. Saudi Arabia is giving us, and as I said, the American situation gives me hope that the, the, it will happen. Yes, please. <coughs> going back to that group of Indians that uh, have gone there and they are in a very difficult position attacked by these ASI groups. I got a very stupid uh, uh, thought. You said that no thought is stupid, but go ahead. Uh, that uh, this uh, line lock they are facing, it is going to be a de facto state. Why, why don't we recognize them so that we can uh, then see that our persons are, are safe there? Well, uh, I know that you can recognize a state. I mean, we have recognized states which do not have defined borders, for example, Palestine. 
it doesn't have a defined border, but we recognize it. But under a, after a many, many decades, I doubt if one should recognize a state of which is firstly instable. The, you're talking of the state carved out by the ISIS. For, is going to be no, no, they. You cannot say it because it is. It has no characteristics even of a de facto state. Let them say we are a state, then we will decide. You know how long we, what our problem cogitation was when Israel became a state? Do you know what happened then? In 1948, when Israel was set up, we had become independent in 47, after the partition of India between Hindus and Muslims. When Israel became independent, the first thing that happened was there was the same uh, debate because the Hindu Mahasabha said, why can't we recognize Israel. So the Congress view was that we can't recognize Israel because we are not a Hindu state, that is a Jewish state, even though it's a democracy. So in 1948, we said we are not recognizing, we are only recognizing that the state of Israel exists, but we'll have no relations with Israel. And that situation continued from 1948 till 1992. When the Arabs and the Jews started talking to each other, we finally decided that we can't be more holy than the Pope. And then we recognize Israel. This is the time it has taken for India to deal with a state like Israel where there was no doubt, how can we even recognize a state like this? And what is its effect going to be on the Muslim community in India? No, uh, that, is, that is too, uh, too facile. A, and I agree, uh, what I would say is that first we must move all our people from these five provinces of Raqqa, Derazor, Diala, Mosul, and Anbar, and move them either out to India or some other job somewhere else. It's difficult right now because in wartime, one like condition, believe me, it's extremely difficult to, all that you have to prove or provide to the people that are there is that look, the window is open. Whenever you want to go, we'll take you to India. Because most people of the kind I mentioned who have really sold everything to go there and make money and come back, who therefore would like to move it to the last bit till life and limb is actually threatened. Once they know that I can go anytime, you have actually done away with the feeling of being bottled up. That's what the government has to do. And that's the only thing you can do at this stage, because these people went there of their own free will. Nobody forced them to go there. They will come back also of their own free will. Nobody is going to tell them to come back. That's the last thing. You try telling an Indian to do anything you won't do, but not least of all this. Yes, sir? I would like to know, you said that there is a fight within the Sunni community. Yes. In, in the northern Iraq or Western Iraq. There was a, in 2007, there was a real cooperation with the, with the, uh, with the, with the American and with the um, that ruling elites to evict them, this Islamic fund, the radicals, what we are talking about. But this is called in the Arabi Shaiba, which is, which is known as Latin. Well, that forces were there. But they were dismantled in spite of all the agreement. They in be, where, where? In, 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 in northern Iraq. In northern Iraq, they have been dismantled. In, they, there was agreement with the USA. That's why Obama was very reluctant to cooperate with this region. So I feel this is the crux. And every vice president, former vice president of Iraq, said, "What is? Where is the blueprint of their development? Where is the vision of nation building? This is a really a crux. And they will not really." Stabilize the nation because there is a lot of dissension within that ethnic, northern ethnic, what we say, sectorial group. So this is, I feel, this is also a problem. And I also would like to know you mentioned a lot about Kurds. What would be the fallout? Just one minute. What would be the fallout of this independence in Turkey? That would be because you said that 20 percent population is Kurds. Well, as I mentioned, that uh, firstly, if I take your second question first, there is as yet no uh, sort of overt movement towards independence by the Kurds, either in Iran or in Turkey. The only thing that presently exists as far as Turkey is concerned is the PKK, 
whose uh, leader Abdullah Ojalan is in a Turkish jail. But that doesn't mean the movement has gone. They, he, they, that still functions out of Iraq, northern Iraq on the Iraq-Turkish border. What you're talking about, what the... Um, Well, they have said they want to have a, they have announced that they want to have a referendum on whether they should separate. We'll see what happens. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. And on the uh, thing about what may have happened in 2007 in northern Iraq when the Americans were still in occupation, you know that there was all this surge, there was all sorts of things. The Americans were playing all ends against each other in order to ensure that these uh, more extremists were eliminated. It didn't happen. Today in Syria, most of them actually cross the border. There are 130,000 extremist Salafis today in Syria who have been getting money. Some of them go there because of some kind of a conviction that they are fighting for religion. But some of them are just going there because this is a good way to earn a living. That's all there is to it. Yes, you had a question? Uh, rotate the power, rotate the power into representation to all the groups have local community areas with, the, with that power. That is the main solution. Close down the borders and stop immigration of people. This You're way, talking of Indians? Not Indians, there in that there. place. Yeah. There. And so how, so how could those, uh, how could one like Salafis uh, catch, uh, control uh, one million uh, Iraqi soldiers? How did they get the launchers, all the arms? How are they trained? Nobody's asking these questions. Very good point. I'm not here to defend the Iraqi army, but I can tell you that uh, even Prime Minister Malki said when they just ran from Mosul, is that, uh, you know, he doesn't know, understand how the well-armed army actually just left the arms and went away. But we have some experience, I can tell you between us that we have some experience of whether the Iraqis are good soldiers or not. First, uh, uh, experience is because du during Saddam Hussein's time we had army and air force training teams in for the Iraqi army and air force. When the Iraq-Iran war broke out, the Iraqi air force actually told our pilots that now you fly our planes and bomb the Iranians. And our, our training teams actually sought uh, instruction that what are we supposed to do? We said we are withdrawing our teams. <laughs> what else could we do? Similarly, uh, the Iraqis are full of bluster, but if you are thinking that they are great soldiers, they are not. And that is the, one of the reasons why uh, actually uh, they, the Iraqis know Indian soldiers. They know Indian soldiers because if you go up and down the length and breadth of Iraq, there are graves of Indian soldiers from the Mesopotamian War, the First World War and the Second World War. And uh, that was actually one of the reasons why I, one of the reasons, there are many, when I reported about whether we should accede to the American uh, demand to send 15,000 troops to help in Kurdistan, I said no, because, you know, as I told you, there was a Turkish brigade inside Iraq, which, while pretending that they were going to hit PKK from the back, were actually ensuring that the Kurdish militia don't get into Erbil. Now, in the... And towards the end of the First World War, there was a battle between the British Indian Army and the Turkish Ottoman Army right there. And there is a grave there. And I said, the last thing we want to actually engage Turkish forces in Iraq. So that was, so, but they know what happened. In fact, the Arabs had revolted in around uh, early 1900s and the British didn't know what to do. So they got a uh, two battalions of Gurkha soldiers, and this happened in the souk of Baghdad, the big market. And the Iraqis, of course, are physically big fellows, and our Gurkhas are not physically big. They started laughing, thinking that he koi bachcho ko le hai. <laughs> The next thing they knew, the, the uh, kukri ke saath, the, uh, our soldiers had just run through the Iraqis. After that, they have never opened their mouth against the bravery of Indian soldiers. And the Indian camp, which was there in Baghdad is called Arasat of India. Arasat is camp, the Indian camp. That was, that's what that area is known as. It was a suburb of Baghdad. During Saddam Hussein's time and even today, it is now the poshest suburb of Baghdad. So, the, so much for what can be done and what cannot be done. A people will only do what they want to do.
Thank you. I think uh, oh, I'm happy to. Uh, yeah, and go back. The second is Habbania. You know, Habbania is presently is a suburb of uh, Baghdad. Um, it is also it was a British military base during colonial time. Then it became Saddam Hussein's military base. Then it became the Iraqi's military base. I don't know whose military base it is, but that's the one the Americans were very keen on keeping. But the did not agree. But Habbania is a beautiful lake, and it was a very important. Uh, Cog in the way flights took off from India to England. Because if you, uh, as you know, during till the end of the interwar years, if you had to take a flight from India to UK, you had to go to Calcutta and then the, because planes would land on water. So you had to take a plane which took off from Salt Lake. There was water then. And then went, the first stop was Habbania. And then from Habbania, it would land then in the Lago di Bracciano in the, near Rome, big lake. And then from there, it would go to UK. That's how the flights took place, because it had to land and take off on water. And Nehru writes in his uh, Glimpses of World History on his visit to London, he's writing about looking down at Habbania, and he said, I looked around and looked to me like this was the center of the world. It was, because you know everywhere it had to go through. So that, that's the kind of history and culture and that is being lost. Najaf and Karbala and the Begums of Awad, this is another interesting story. Uh, now, Najaf and Karbala, as you all heard of, this, these are the two shrine cities, very, very revered uh, by the Shias. Um, and the big battle took place. Now, you have all heard of the Begum of Awad, Begums of Awad and Warren Hastings who took a loan from the Begums of Awad when the East India Company was broke. But the understanding with the Begums of Awad was that uh, the principal will not be repaid, <laughs> they will only get the interest. <coughs> so what could they do? I mean, Warren Hastings was the guy who was a uh, power in India. So they said, fine. So they said, the interest that you pay us on this loan that we are given you should go for Shia theological studies in Najaf and Karbala by Shia Muslims from Lucknow. So from that time onwards till today, in Najaf and Karbala, you have a huge community of Indian Shia scholars who have been living there and now they must be in the, some of them are in the third and fourth generation. And so these scholarships used to be given by the British embassy then in Iraq. Then when India became independent, uh, we actually took over First, we had a legation before, before we became independent, so we started giving these scholarships. Then, at independence, Nehru was told that, why are we doing this? There are no Begums of Awad now. There is no principle in any way case. There is no interest. There is no East India Company. Why are we giving all these scholarships? At that stage, Maharana Azad told Nehru that, don't stop it. We have just been through the trauma of partition. So we said, okay, we'll continue to give the scholarship. So even when we were in Baghdad, every time we'd go to Najab Karbala and hand out. And by then, the value of the scholarship, like those days, of course, five Iraqi dinars was $15, which was still a good sum. Now, of course, five Iraqi dinars, probably 50 paisa. Uh, anyway, but these scholarships are a matter of great prestige for these families. Finally, in 1984, 85, up to 88, when Saddam Hussein really started a massive campaign against the Shias, you just pick people up and have them dropped at the, on the Iran border. This is what was happening. Then slowly we phased out that scholarship scheme. But that is our old link with, uh, and it still remains. I mean, a lot of people. Then, um, as I mentioned about the spilling of Indian blood, Arasat of India, Basra Pals. Now, there was a time when Indian ladies in the 1930s, 40s talked of Basra pearls because they used to dive for pearls in Basra. And it went long time ago <laughs> during Saddam Hussein's time. And of course, Iraqi dates are supposed to be best in the world. But, but <laughs> let me uh, end on a very funny uh, story about dates. There's this uh, 
Arab professor and an English professor traveling in a British plane, British train, and he says, well, I'm from Iraq. So he said, uh, so he said, you know, our dates are the best. So he said, uh, he asked the British professor, that, do you have dates? He thought something else. He said, so long as they don't have too many. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I have, uh, yes. I have two questions. Please. What do you think is the, is the future of the caliphate? Hmm? Because uh, it's after a fairly long time that uh, the caliphate in whatever form has come into existence again after having been you know, abolished by Ataturk. And the second question is, what is, what is going to happen in Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia is the, is the custodian of uh, the two holiest shrines of uh, Islam. And after having promoted extremism with their petrodollars all over the world, including in India, now they are beginning to get worried because recently, you know, they have, uh, they have said, you know, no compromise with terrorists and all that. So how is all this going to, you know, likely to pan out in the future? Uh, so about the caliphate, I would not go so far as to say that the caliphate has been established. Let's say this guy, Mr. Abu Bakr Baghdadi, Baghdadi was a prisoner in Saddam Hussein's jail, has announced that he's the caliph and there's a caliphate. I would also not want to link it with the Khilafat movement that... Uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan and Mahatma Gandhi were all involved with, which was the Ottoman Caliphate. Because the conceptions are quite different. Uh, what the Ottoman Caliphate was, certainly it was a Caliphate because he was a Caliph in the sense of the person who was the protector of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. Basically, not Najaf and Karbala, Mecca and Medina, because mainstream Islam is Sunni. Um, that is all. In all the Ottoman Empire, and which lasted for 500 years across all of North Africa, almost up to here, there was no compulsion to become Muslim. Minorities were protected, whether it was the Jews or the Christians and so on. What Mr. Abu Bakr Baghdadi is saying is what I mentioned, what's called broadly by the name of Nizam and Mustafa, that is Muhammad's law, which is Sharia law. Now, if you see today, Okay, there is, all the Gulf is Sharia country. Many Indians don't realize who go in and out of Dubai and buy properties there that this is Sharia country. And we are on the wrong side of the Sharia country. When I say we, I'm talking of Hindus or non-Muslims. Uh, but that is definitely Sharia country. Turkey is not. Most of the rest of the Middle East is not. So there's a large part of Malaysia is not. Indonesia is not. Because there you, they have made a distinction between what is personal law and what is civil law. Meaning, where in marriage, birth and death, possibly they follow Muslim law, like we do us. But in other cases, it's, it's a more open society. Now, if Islamic countries today have not followed Sharia law, how can we say that a caliphate can be established? I don't believe so. Because, firstly, there is far more information. There is far more interest in what happens to others. And most countries have become cosmo, uh, co uh, composite. Take United States. I mean, for, for a long time we thought there are only whites there. But now, <laughs> in fact, the balance is going to change there pretty soon with, with the Mexicans and the Indians and all sorts of people who are there. So I would like to beg to deserve, differ that there is not going to be a caliphate, even in possible, even within Islam. Forget about these people wanting to conquer. They've put out a map which only excludes Kerala. <laughs> as part of their caliphate. Can you believe that? <laughs> so, so that is uh, the first question. Second was, sorry. Uh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, Saudi Arabia. Now, this is a very interesting case. Saudi Arabia derives this legitimacy from that basic agreement with uh, FDR, I mean Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and King Ibn Saud, that basically, we'll give you your oil, you see that my family is protected. That is what is happening. But slowly within the family, finally, because of course it's all a, it's all a gerontocracy, because 
one brother is 80 years old, next guy who comes will be 79 and third fellow is 78. Slowly the younger princes have started rebelling because you know they are all on a dole. That is one. So there is some movement within the Saudi family which will not last if this agreement doesn't last. That is the first fear that the Saudis have that if indeed Americans become self-sufficient in oil and gas, I mean, they will become self-sufficient. There's no question the Alaskan oil is coming. If not 2015, 2020, but it's going to happen. So their interest by, you know, will lessen in this part of the world, I mean, in that part of the world, and their requirement for the... So they are really worried about that. What happens to our agreement? How does our family get protected? So that is something which is still a big question mark. Second is that all these years, the Saudis have been propagating uh, their brand of Islam, which is, I mean, those days Wahhabi Islam was considered really extreme. Now you got, you know, some people about 100 degrees on the other side of it. But anyway, they were promoting that and promoting that not through government, not only through government funding, but also through funding which they allowed to private trust. The big trust that they have is called Rabita. Even in India, when I was secretary, I, that's the first time a Saudi ambassador came to me and said, I will give you the list of whom we are funding. You tell me which ones to fund and which one not. It was a revolutionary move, development that happened. Because these people have been going around giving money all over the place. Now, now why have they slowly started opening this thing is because they've realized that uh, all this is coming home to roost. Firstly, 9-11, okay, whatever it was, these were educated Saudis. Let's face it, out of those 19, I think 11 were Saudis. And all along is the same story now. So that is why they've changed their whole tactics as far as Muslim Brotherhood is concerned. Now, right now, of course, after the Arab Spring, everybody said Muslim Brotherhood because they were the only organized group in the Islamic world, in spite of the fact that, that for 50 years they were really beaten on the head. I mean, Assad really finished them off in Amma and so all over the place because nobody wanted that kind of life. But now it's coming back, but Saudis realize that if these people are going to come back and, you know, eat us up. So they have, so this is why they have become worry one. All this is self-preservation, nothing else. In all these countries, it is only the normal. They are not thinking of the Saudi people, whatever they are. But we have to think very carefully about our massive involvement in Saudi Arabia. And what I find strange is we are like three million people. Okay, most of them are nurses, drivers, cooks, some, and a lot of professional people. But we do not realize our own strength. What is the population of Saudis in relation to the Indians? We will be a very large proportion of the population. If there was even some kind of a feeling that we have to stand together if there's instability, that's good enough. The Saudi, it will put Saudis on notice. But we have to think of some of these things that need to be done. These are serious matters which unfortunately, you know, we, uh, sound bites, you know, somebody's kidnapped, released, then bhool gaya. But there needs to be a long-term strategy because instability, in my view, is going to be the name of the game for the next five to seven years in this part of the region. Instability is going to descend to the Gulf and we are going to be terribly affected. Or we need to see that we are not affected. Let me put it the other way. Thank you. Yeah. I have two observations to make. I would like to have your view on that. Sure. Uh, as you said, rightly said, uh, ISIS today though looks like a de facto state and a quite a militant state within, uh, which is a though landlocked state and without any resources. Mm -hmm. I see it more like a game of brinkmanship between people who are involved, the Americans, the Iranians, the Turks, the Saudis, Qataris. Like on one hand, everybody is what, waiting for other party to make first move. And that's why the situation is allowing ISIS to like American want, Americans want Nouri al-Malki to step down or share power with Sunnis. Americans also want Iranians to share some of the burden because Americans alone cannot share burden and Iranians alone cannot benefit from uh, Iraq. Then Turkey, I mean, uh, Saudis are watching if Iranians make first move or 
so so uh, the movement isis will uh, try to establish its power in uh, the region they will control these states will uh, pounce on them and maybe that isis will not be i mean that kill that their territory or what they claim as a state will not be exist anymore second i wanted to know i mean this is just my recent observation that uh, the exist the current conflict between uh, in gaza what i noticed i mean which is different from other conflicts in 2009 and 2011 this time there is a muted response from sunni world and is it is it that iranians who are i mean that way they are extremely worried because of this isis phenomenon they tried their proxies in uh, gaza to escalate i mean the, the conflict is the, the situation is always at the boiling point but this time what i have seen is saudi response is very muted iranians and in shia people i mean shia clerics in india and elsewhere they are more vocal about condemning or supporting uh, uh, like uh, palestinians or hamas the uh, suddenly saudis were silent but turkeys and uh, qataris they are, uh, and egyptians are brokering peace egyptian uh, brokered twice peace but it was rejected by hamas again what is uh, i mean it was a great surprise that hamas could uh, deliver missiles going 100 kilometers but from warfare point of view it was a stupidity because what they are going to achieve out of this conflict is unknown but still they are continuing war maybe because they have some instruction and is it i mean is it result do you see some kind of like the situation tension spilling in the iraq and syria region they are spilling even the outside conflict so that uh, uh, And do you agree? I mean, I I I made two observations. I wanted his views on this. So the first observation was the ISIS will not last as a because the because of the brink punching. No, no. Uh, I I think uh, you know it's it's very easy to say brink punching. There are a number of you're right. There are a number of interests involved in backing different groups. There's no question about that, including the IS, IS or IS or whatever you want to call it. but remember one thing that now this border as i said i wouldn't say it's yet obliterated but this border is probably non existent so long as the isis will control this area right so what is happening right now bloodletting is going on between the shias and sunnis between sunnis and sunnis and all the others are running for cover one thing that is not going to happen is I mean, okay. What has happened is that what's happening in Syria has spilled over to Lebanon because there are supporters of Assad in Lebanon. Assad was forced to take his army out after the assassination of Hariri in 2005. But, but other than that, it has the only way it has spilled into Jordan is the uh, refugee camp at Zatari, which is here, which has almost a million refugees plus more. but it has not yet spilled into iran and uh, even kuwait and it is not going to happen because this is more like an implosion than an explosion why because of the composite nature of the societies here all these con- these countries definitely turkey and iran and jordan and to some extent saudi arabia in the lower part are going to ensure that it doesn't come across the border they are going to try their level best whatever the western countries or americans might want to do the americans have had a very ambivalent kind of policy i know way back in 1997 when i was in where was i in syria the americans floated a news uh, uh, kind of a note uh, which was confirmed to me by our then ambassador in jeddah who is now a vice president uh, that Uh, they said you know the coming trend in this part of the world is going to be islamic governments and we better realign our policy to know how to do business with them this then of course when so they have been changing so don't believe what the americans do in any case they are going to do it for their interest we have to think of our interest so this is basically at this time it is going to be an implosion not an explosion because this has become really the battleground for the proxy war between iran and saudi arabia which has become overt in all these places so these are all pockets where they are fighting it out uh but we know the strengths and weaknesses of each of these countries right that so that should be the answer to your or um, not answer but anyway my comment the second one was what was like on this uh, israel hamas 
Yeah, now, okay, that's, that's a good point. The thing is that you're right in thinking that right now all the Arab countries are totally preoccupied with what's going on. It was a perfect time for the Israelis to take on Hamas. But it is wrong to actually believe that this is a fight against Hamas. Because as you know, there is a unity government in place which consists of the Al Fatah and of the Hamas. After a long many years, they have decided to come together on one platform. And, and at that time, Netanyahu made a statement saying, they can't do this. They either have to choose Israel or choose Hamas. But this is what the Israelis have said. So their strategy in actually degrading whatever capability the Hamas may have acquired is to ensure that this remains, that the Hamas cannot raise its head. So this is the background to what is going on right now. And there's also the background to why the Arabs are not speaking up. That's The Saudis are muted, but uh, Iran and Shia are very active in supporting Hamas. Yeah. Who has created Hamas? Hmm? Who has created Hamas? Hamas was created by whom? You tell me. Exa well, that's one story. <laughs> but anyway, the, the point is that this is a misrepresented fire. You should not believe the media. The thing is that the Israel finds it the best time. Already Syria is weakened or non-existent. Iraq is weakened. Why not we can... Uh... No, but it's accepted twice the peace proposal from Egypt. But yes. it is declined by Hamas and maybe and, uh, Turkey and Qatar are uh, for, uh, pressurizing Hamas to decline the peace proposal from Egypt. So I think there is... Natu uh, because Saudis are supporting Egypt. So naturally Qatar will... Muslim so you, you have to just understand how these alignments are working and changing. It's Nothing is immutable in this part of the world. slightly different offhand uh, question, uh, which is that um, in the Gulf region, I understand Dubai itself, you being the ambassador, I'm asking this question, is that um, Dubai alone is generating $1 billion per day of oil, right? Now, if, if you take the oil that is extracted in this whole region, India has had banks for I don't know how long in this region. And the monies that are collected from there, we could have solved our poverty in a flash if we collect a percentage of the daily collection that they generate, our Indian banks. But we don't do that. And I asked the State Bank of India, the, the, the manager there, what do you collect over there? They've got four branches, SBI in Dubai alone. And they only collect expatriate salaries. Can you explain why India is so inefficient in, and so short-sighted and not able to solve the poverty problem? We are fighting over 50 crores, we are writing of, writing of 100 crores and 200 crores and I mean it's nothing compared to 1 billion dollar per day in Dubai alone. So what about the whole region and why are we not collecting uh, proper money from the banks? What is the problem with the politico of India? Thank you. I presume when you say collect, you are talking of banks, Indian banks setting up there and uh, attracting funds from those governments or those companies. That's what you mean. Now, there are banking laws in each country. And we have to follow the existing banking laws in whatever countries there are, exactly like foreign banks have to follow banking laws in India. So the extent of what you can actually collect, so to say, is difficult unless you are able to conform to whatever regulations they have. That has to be the reason why we are not getting the amount of money. This, there's another point that surprisingly, in spite of all this business about solidarity with India, with third world, all that kind of thing, the Arabs, and in spite of 9-11 and everything, the Arabs still feel that their money is secure in Western banks. I'll give you one example. When I had gone to Dubai and Abu Dhabi with President Abdul Kalam, 
those days, uh, Sheikh Zayed was alive, but he was in bad health. He died soon after. But his son, who is now the Amir of Abu Dhabi, came to meet us, specifically in a private meeting. And, he, and this is, I'm quoting his words. He told President Kalam that my father has asked me to tell you that we have one trillion dollars right now, part, the word he uses, part, in Western banks. Please give us projects. We actually want to invest it in India. Why we did not do it? You know, the problem with India is we are extremely good at talking, but we are very poor at delivery. It, we suffer on that with everything that we say, including right now in Bangladesh and Nepal. But let me not get into that. But basically, they, they, their own preference is that, you know, we don't know whether our money will be safe in Indian banks. Because the Indian banking sector, if you take the whole net worth of the Indian banking sector, what is it worth? In relation to one bank of America, where, are, where do we stand? I can't give you the figures, but I used to know the old figures. We need to, it is all a function, number one, of how effectively your economy is able to absorb money. In fact, we actually had a meeting in the Prime Minister's office when Rajesh Mishra was there. We called all the banks saying, look, this guy says he's got $1 trillion. And we had already asked our banks to check up how much of that $1 trillion was available in liquid, meaning immediately that the cash could be transferred. Out of that $1 trillion, around uh, four to five, uh, three to four hundred million dollars were available in liquid. So then we asked the banks, okay, will you be able to take this money? The first thing was, how will this money come? You need a proper project profile which has been studied, but our bank said, even if there are proper project profiles that are given to us, they will transfer the money and the meter will start ticking till you can actually start putting money into the ground. We are going to keep paying interest. And they said, we just can't afford it. This is the reality. It's nice to say that I wish all this money would come into Indian banks and then our poverty is solved. Life is not that simple. Life is pretty complicated when you come down to the nitty gritty of it. But I take your point. I think we have to encourage our banks to go out of India and to start reaping some for which again you would have to do special things. You take the what the Vajpayee government did, the resurgent India bonds. Why did we have the resurgent India bond issue? Because the United States put sanctions on us after our nuclear tests. And our estimate was that we would lose $4 billion of revenue per year on this thing, which is not a big amount then. So we issued this bond at 8%, which is far more than the interest that you get in any Western bank, which is more than the interest in India, and full repatriation of the money put in. And that is how we were able to literally in three months raise $4 billion, which means that the government put itself out on a limb to repatriate all the foreign exchange within five years at a rate of interest, which was basically unrealistic. But we wanted to raise the money. So when you want to do this, you have to be dynamic. You can do it if you are confident of your economy. Now everything again comes down to that. Last question. Last question. Uh, actually, I just had, uh, going back to, it's, what do you think about um, Indians um, actually going to Iraq and Syria to fight against ISI? Yes. Do you think um, that's a significant um, development? Or? Actually, that is a point I wanted to mention, that what is happening there has come all the way to Pakistan. You know that not a day goes by in Pakistan without some Shia mosque being attacked, some Shia being killed. It has not yet crossed the border. Our biggest concern is to ensure it doesn't cross the border. But this, what you refer to, which is of these young Indians, and who are all educated Indians, at least reading, they've all gone to university and all that, chucking up everything and going to fight for eyes. We have to find a viable way why this is happening. Why is this happening? Maybe one could say you go back to the roots. And what are the roots? The Sachar Committee and the fact that the Muslims are not getting their rightful share in jobs and employment. In the end, where else? Where is the root to all of all this? So we have to think of something from these guys. Also, there was, uh, I just want to uh, bring in, in light of today's... Can you take the mic because I'm not able to... This is the last question, I think. Uh, yeah. should go. No, I just want to say, isn't it true that Muslim terrorist groups purposely put children and women in front of the, you, you know, in um, <coughs> border, like the Hamas group? 
Now, the, like Mr. Sudhendra Kulkarni said, the, you know, ch the children were killed because of the missiles uh, sent by Iraq, the Israeli government. But doesn't uh, they know, Hamas knows that they're going to be missiled. It's been happening for years. Why do they have children at that, at that place, you know? What I'm saying, they, they do it purposely so that they get... Uh, the world, uh, sympathy and things like that, you know, that's what I think. What do you think? You know, unfortunately, uh, you know, I will not say that it's not happening. It's possible that civilians and possibly children are also being used as hostages. It doesn't happen only in Gaza. It happened in North Sri Lanka. The LTT during its last days was doing exactly the same thing, using civilian Tamils children and women, they f stopped them from leaving the zone, the war zone, as it was shrinking when they were being pushed back by the Sri Lanka army into the sea, more or less, the last hundred meters, they still had civilians being used as, in the hope that, th therefore, the army will stop its degradation. They didn't. And so, I'm not saying whether Hamas is doing it or not, but this has, unfortunately, become a classic tactic of internal warfare. And if you see the number of wars between states and wars within states in the last 50 years, the ratio is 1 to 80. And this has become, the, everywhere you find most of the wars are intra-state, not interstate, because that war doesn't exist anymore. So this is, one is using of civilians, and women and children as hostages. Second is rape of women. Rape is being used today in the Democratic Republic of Congo in uh, a number of countries where internal strife is taking place as a tool of war. Tragedy, but that's the reality. Thank you very much.